Hey everyone, welcome to week 52. This is our fifth day. This is our last day on our bold and sensitive week. We have painted Damon Hurst. We have painted Alex Mean. We have painted Fed, a very, very expressive uh, Fed. We painted Millie. Uh, yesterday was a super, super nice painting. I really, really liked it. And today we're going to paint my sister, Luisa. She says, I never paint her, so we'll see how we do. Uh, remember, next week, new theme, we're going to be here, so hopefully you can be here with us. Okay, let's get started. Uh, this is day five. This is our last day in our bold and sensitive week. Remember, throughout this week, we've been having as our constant, our very trusted four-color palette, which means that we're working with a Zorn palette. In my case, it's titanium white, yellow ochre, cad red, and ivory black. Those are the pigments that I use to interpret that four color palette. You could use other pigments. You could use a flake white if you want. You could use another earth yellow. You could use a gold ochre or a raw sienna. I think that it is wise to have though a lighter yellow in the yellow hue just so that you can have a nice range in terms of value, in terms of the native value of the pigments uh, in that palette. Because I think the way it's set up, you know, titanium white, yellow ochre, cad red, and ivory black. I'm not saying it's this perfect traveling of the value range from light to dark in that order, but there is enough difference in the native value of the pigments that you give yourself a chance to use that value to your advantage. Why am I saying this? Because in a little bit, I'm going to explain how sometimes it's a bit difficult to try and adjust this palette and accommodate it to give it a certain character. And there's a specific character that I was looking for the uh, palette today that I've always found to be quite difficult to achieve, but I think we gave it a, a really nice try today and I was very happy with the result. But let's talk about yesterday's painting first. Uh, I was very, very happy, very happy. I think yesterday I described that painting as a really perfect, um, I don't wanna say conclusion, you know, but I think it was a perfect pairing with the painting that I did on Wednesday. So Fer's painting on Wednesday and Millie's painting on Thursday were a very nice example of what this week means. You know, when to be bold and then when to understand the requirements of the painting. I guess requirements in the sense that they are sort of the rules that you have set out for yourself and the things that you have to try and achieve based on your intent. And my intent yesterday, obviously, was trying to be a bit more sensible. I'm never going to be Bouguereau. That's not the painter that I am. Sometimes I feel that people think that because, you know, you can paint in this wide variety of manners, and there's certainly painters throughout history and obviously contemporary painters too, that have enormous range. You know, they can be super expressive, but they can also be very subtle and very careful, very uh, patient while they paint. So they're capable of producing this kind of beautifully controlled version of naturalism. There are painters like that right now, and there have been throughout history, obviously. I think that those are extraordinary examples, though. Um, I think that for somebody like myself, my balance is very much so inclined towards one side, and it's always going to be you know, the butcher side. <laughs> I'm always going to have heavy hands. I'm always going to be a little more expressive, a little more character driven. I don't have the ability to recognize that classical beauty aspect of nature. I don't have that. My eyes don't work that way. What are considered flaws to me, you know, they're obviously not, but I always consider those moments in nature as being true examples of the very random, arbitrary nature of this universe. And I love that. I love that. I think I equate those moments with um, things that I don't expect. If the universe becomes something that can be imaginable, if what we're doing is setting up these laws to construct canons of beauty and aesthetics, and then we have to try and exalt those through painting, then that doesn't interest me that much. I'm not saying I have a problem with that. For example, I absolutely adore Victorian painting. I love Waterhouse, for example. I think he's an incredible painter. And Waterhouse very much so exemplifies this classical, idealized sense of beauty um, filtered through uh, Victorian aesthetics. So I can be very appreciative of things that I know I'm not, 
But when I'm examining myself, I know that those are not the things that I was meant to paint. I think that my fascination comes from anywhere, you know, <laughs> anywhere. But I don't think this anywhere quality of things means that I have to elevate them through painting or, or that they have to, you know, be touched up through painting. It's not painting as plastic surgery. It's painting as a vehicle to be able to experience, you know, these moments. And that's about it. So I really like the random quality of nature. By the way, I believe in that, actually. I believe that Everything that is happening around us, everything that's happened, you know, before the Big Bang, after the Big Bang, it's just luck. It's just randomness and it's beautiful randomness. And it's very understandable why we as humans just don't want to accept that because we want to believe that there's order to things, that there's reason to things. But I would much rather believe that everything is just consequence of a random set of events that unchained even more random events. And billions of years later, it just eventually landed on us. And in millions of years, when we're gone from this planet, those events are going to create something else, something equally as wonderful, because they're all wonderful things. A freaking dinosaur. We're never going to be on this earth for as long as dinosaurs were part of this earth, for example. They were the ones that ruled this planet it took an asteroid to kick them out if there wasn't an asteroid it would be like a rent control apartment in new york nobody was leaving earth they'd probably still be here they'd probably be chilling they'd be ruling planet earth this would be like a flintstones episode we would be working on a brachiosaurus i have no idea where i'm going with this <laughs> Anyways, let's go back to the palette. It's Friday. It's Friday. We should call Fridays like detour day. We've been working for four days. On the fifth day, we rest. I think I was going somewhere with that, but let's go back to yesterday's exercise. I was saying how I think I'm meant to be a heavy-handed painter. So yesterday, I think it's as subtle as I can be. I mean, I've painted other things where I almost like surprised myself and I noticed that I can be pretty sensitive. But I think yesterday I was being pretty sensitive given the conditions that I gave myself for this week, given the things that I want to push throughout this week. So it's, it wasn't just about making this sweet, soft painting. It was also about being bold during that process. So I think that yesterday's painting was a really nice balance between those two powerful forces because on Wednesday, you know, I went full gesture. I mean, I had to slow down to be able to paint some instances in Fer's uh, portrait that demanded that I was a little more careful. But I think it was a lot more careful with Millie's uh, painting yesterday. When I started drawing, I told myself, come on, take your time and then respect that drawing. See that drawing as a stepping stone for your painting. Understand everything that's good about it and understand where you can take chances in that drawing and what are the important moments during that drawing that you have to take care of. So I think I recognized those things well yesterday. Now, talking about today's painting, um, I was saying that it's a little hard to explain, but for today's exercise, I was trying to emphasize an area of the palette that perhaps seems somewhat obvious, but it's not quite apparent when you're mixing your paint. So for this painting, I'm trying to emphasize the earthy quality of a Zorn color palette, of that four color palette. Now, what does that mean? It may seem kind of easy, because we could argue that all we have to do is just make it uh, yellow ochre dominant. You know, we have an earth tone in the palette. I'm not going to count ivory black as an earth tone. I think it's a very, very different color. You know, I talked about how in my own sensibility, I really understand that black pigment is quite different from other earth tones. Now, if you want to go super old school and you want to say, well, it kind of does feel like an earth tone if you have like an all earth palette like if you're working with titanium white and yellow ochre raw sienna burnt sienna burnt umber raw umber ivory black that's going to make a lot of sense right but i do feel that there's such blueness to that black maybe it's just a nature's version of a primary color palette right maybe nature always wanted us to paint with a yellow ochre a red ochre and a black. There you go. There you have it. You have a yellow, a red, and a blue, quote unquote. And that's it. That's our very earthy primary color palette. And that's the way we, and when I say we, I'm not talking about we as painters in 2021. I'm talking about we as humanity trying to recognize what earth was giving to us and how we could use it to try and, you know, use these colors and, and relate them to each other and understand how to create harmonies between these four colors. I think that at its core, that's why I love 
you know, a Zorn palette just makes me think about that very earthy, very primitive palette, which I feel that that's, you know, that that's the core of painting. The core of painting doesn't lie in bismuth yellow and cobalt teal and quinacridone magenta. You know, all these colors that are amazing, they're available to us nowadays. Yeah, those are beautiful colors. And we have to be grateful that there's very sensitive, very committed people that care a lot about color making and a lot about painting, crafting these colors, manufacturing these colors many times by hand so that we can have at our disposal amazing, amazing pigments. You know, Michael Harding, the people at Rublev, those people do an incredible job and they deserve so much praise because they do things lovingly. But you know, this is not about negating those things that are available to us. For some reason, I feel, you know, it's like having like a super old soul. And I feel that I connect with painting when I realize that this originated with dirt and that there's no reason why we should, you know, leave that behind. We, we could use all these new colors. That's totally fine. But we also have to have a sense of what brought us here, I feel of the building blocks of painting. And I love that. And I, I'm not saying that, you know, the earliest paintings wouldn't have available to them, you know, highly chromatic colors. No, I'm sure that we even use things that were never recorded. Human beings are so ingenious that I'm sure we found amazing ways to achieve color through our exploration and observation of nature. That could have happened 10,000 years ago, and we just don't know about it because it was never recorded. I don't know. I always like to believe that that is the way I ground myself. That's my grounding wire. That makes me have a sense of the gravity that I think goes hand in hand with painting for some reason. So for today's painting, I was trying to extract as much as I could from that kind of native earth tone quality that the painting can offer to us. Now, the balance has to be just, just right, because if you think about it, if we mix too much black into, you know, our yellow ochre or a, a mix of our yellow ochre with cad red, that ivory black is going to turn that yellow ochre into a green gray, right? So even though that is gray and it's going to feel a little bit earthier, it's still going to be of a green hue and we can't go that far. Same thing goes for mixes of cad red and ivory black. If we go way too much into that direction, then that's going to start to feel like a violet, especially if we start to lighten that mix. You have to be super, super subtle and understand like the area of the palette that you want to work with. And you have to push yourself. You have to remind yourself that you have to work within a very strict moment of that palette. So we're going to use like a different meaning of being sensitive today. And I think that we're going to understand it, not as sensibility in the way we understood it yesterday, which was just trying to hold on to a nice drawing. I mean, I thought it was nice, but a, a nice sensible drawing. And instead, what we're going to do is understand that we have to be quite responsible with our use of our palette. And we have to be again, acute enough to understand that we're going to have to move in a very, very small instance of this palette. So we have to have a heightened sensibility today, not in the paint application, not in terms of the drawing that we have to respect, but in our recognition of our palette and the areas of our palette that we have to work on. That's where we're going to be our most sensitive today. So that's what I wanted to push today. That's why there is a dominance, I feel, of an ochery, earthy quality to it. Now, at the beginning, I was saying how having a yellow ochre that's a lighter value, there's synthetic yellow ochres and there's natural yellow ochres. Natural ochres are far grittier and far more transparent. They're beautiful pigments, but they're quite different from the more synthetic ones. Um, the more synthetic ones, which is the one that I'm using right now, those tend to be more opaque especially when compared to the natural earth pigments. Because it is a yellow, because it is opaque, when you try to get, you know, let's say like a darker earth tone, that yellow ochre is always going to feel like it chalks everything up. Obviously, I'm not equating, you know, yellow ochre to like titanium white. When you're trying to lighten up a dark mix, um, it does feel like yellow ochre is a bit too opaque, a bit too light, and it almost like ruins the richness of the color. So there has to be like this perfect, perfect balance. That's why a lot of people, if they want to have a yellow earth, but a yellow earth that's not going to 
have that effect on your dark mixes, they put raw sienna. So raw sienna is a wonderful color. If you want to have accessible a yellow hue in your earth tone, and you want to be able to incorporate that yellow hue into your darker mixes and not feel like you're going to ruin their darker value, their native dark value. That's how people use raw sienna very intelligently, I feel. I haven't found the need to use raw sienna. I thought it was like a weaker pigment and I'm always willing to risk it with yellow ochre. I'm always very conscious of the limitations that I'm going to have with yellow ochre and how it's going to affect the value of the mix, especially if I'm mixing dark tones. Having the natural inclinations that I have as a painter towards grayness and, you know, this muted quality in painting, it just fits perfectly my intent. So that's why I, I kind of love yellow ochre and I don't feel the need to have more colors added to the palette. Today I painted my sister, Luisa. Uh, by the way, she always complains that I never paint her. She's probably true. Although I have painted her a couple of times, I'm gonna ask Danny to show you some paintings that I've done of her. And they're pretty cool. They've always been uh, quite cool paintings. I especially like this one. That's in my mother's house. That's the dining table. So I've always liked that one. I think it feels like her also. So I really like that painting. Yeah, but if it was up to her, I'd be painting her every single day. If I was painting her every single day, she'd be like, you know, you could paint me more. So, <laughs> so today I'm going to paint Luisa. And she's got this great head of hair. And I just wanted to sort of embed her portrait in this wild hair that loses its nature and it just becomes this um, framing device for her face. But I didn't want that framing device to be super tight and to just visibly limit her portrait. Now I want it to be a little more organic just so it feels like a little more wild. Again, more primitive. Perhaps it's because I... I thought about the earth tone side of the palette and I thought how I equate that with a very primary primeval um, sense of painting. So maybe subconsciously I kind of tried to tie those two things together. I really like today's painting. I think it has a lot of character. I think it totally feels like her, almost like a mid-breath, mid-sentence. I think it's a very static image, but it's also... It's almost like tapping into the power of creation that speaking has, that the word has. And I think that that force, that power is about to come out of her mouth or I don't know. Those are the stories that I make up in my head when I paint. But um, but I want to believe those things. You know, those are my little fictions that give me energy so that I can work through a painting. So that's going to be it for today. I think we had a super cool week. I think the Zorn palette is the most beautiful thing in the world. Uh, for next week, we're going to do something a little bit different. And I hope you guys can understand why it's going to be a little bit different. We're going to have to change the format because I'm not going to call it an interview so much as a conversation. I had a, a really wonderful conversation. I was a little bit nervous. I hope you guys forgive me. But, you know, this is a painter that I really, really respect. It's not hyperbolic. I really feel he is the best contemporary painter. So I think we're going to do something a little bit different next week. Again, I hope you guys give it a chance, and I think you're going to like it. I tried so hard to not show my huge fanboyism, but it was there. You know, with everything he was saying, I was like, oh, yeah, me too. Me too. Yeah, we're both the same. We're best friends. So hopefully you guys can identify all the good and forgive all the uh, moments where I just couldn't keep it together. Uh, <laughs> but that's going to be next week. So thank you guys. Love you. As we say on Fridays, Danny and I are super, super grateful. Hopefully you can join us next week and you'll give us a chance to provide you with company. So we'll see you guys next week. Thank you. Bye.